You're listening to 88.7 WLUW Chicago Sound Alliance, broadcasting from the campus of Loyola University. It's live from the heartland, featuring Michael James, Katie Hogan, and Tom Clark. Hey, 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 good morning. Welcome to another edition of Live from the Heartland. It is one rainy morning out there. But the rain, we're going to bring a little sunshine into your life. Stay tuned for the next hour. We have a lot of good uh, information coming your way. This is uh, uh, the day we're going to bring Maria Haddon Haddon. onto our show. And uh, she is a candidate for the Alderman Woman in the 49th Ward. And we are also going to have Glenn Silver, is the director of a great film, 39 years old, but relevant today, called The War at Home. So I'm here with Katie Hogan and Tom Clark, and we're ready to roll. Let's do it. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Tom. We want to acknowledge the passing of the first George Bush as president. Maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more. But it's also World AIDS Day. And um, uh, remembering back to the 70s when this crisis first broke out, we've come a long way. But there's still a lot to be done, and even our current president uh, signed um, renewal of what had been a Bush initiative, which has increased uh, funding for HIV prevention in Africa this past week. He also signed an agreement, our current president, to uh, redo the NAFTA agreement in trade between Mexico and Canada. Evidently Those are about the only two good things we can say about the Trump presidency this past week. Well, that's, it's nice to say two good things. I'm, I'm, congratulations, I'm, Tom. I'm trying to brighten things I'm up on I'm a gray, you know, you. Uh, Saturday morning. But in the, we're bringing the sunshine into your lives today. But in the normal uh, <laughs> scheme of things, um, we are still uh, pushing. Uh, the, the pushing for the wall funding may cause government shutdown, as uh, Dems balk at the $5 million wall pan, plan. Also, um, we're going to just evince proof of the blue wave yes. in action because also this week Democrats in Congress said um, questioned funding uh, for Yemen yes for mm-hmm. the uh, undeclared awful awful things that we are paying for that are being done in your name fellow listeners um, in Yemen please find out about it um, by the way you know 17 year undeclared war in Afghanistan not now tops 800 some billion. That's almost one of those $21 trillion in debt we now have under Trump tax scams. Trump's <laughs> FY fiscal year 2019 budget. It's $833 billion. I love the way these Republicans always act like they're fiscal, you know, responsible, and they are the worst. I went into the weeds a little bit this week looking at budget stuff, and that's where I came up with this last thing because yeah, it sorry, just I didn't blows read me that away. I read it. <laughs> that we're that we're letting this happen in our names. Yeah, I mean we've already run up eight hundred and seventy-five million dollars for this undeclared war. Yeah, and Trump has already added two trillion dollars in his two years. In his two flipping years. Can Thank you, GOP on? tax camp. Well. Uh, I'm glad that uh, Nancy Pelosi secured the House Speaker role. I am glad because I think it's time for the Democrats to work and not work on dividing again. Um, So, yeah, Nancy Pelosi is a a great leader. And And yet one more sign of the Democrats' ascendancy, at least in the House, is that they successfully blocked work requirements for food stamps. Yes, excellent, excellent. They don't quite have the vote yet, but they clearly have the rest of us behind them, and there is perhaps if not a blue wave, at least a purple wave, retaking uh, Congress. We'll see if that leads to some real action or the deadlock that everyone fears. Um, How about bring it a little closer to home? And uh, Ed Burke, who's uh, the longest serving alderman, had his offices raided. What do we know about that, Tom? Well, we don't know much, which is why the speculation is all kind of a little silly, though understandable, given that he's been in office for 50 years. And everyone, I don't don't mean everyone, but folks have tried to go after him in the past, and he has slipped away clean, or at least he claimed he was clean. We'll see what's going on this time. This is probably not related to his getting tax breaks for Trump because um, they didn't raid his law office. It probably has to do with his political work in the city council because both his ward office and the city council office are what got raided. And we don't know if it's related to him or somebody else that he represents. So we'll we'll have to see. Yep. Let's not... Let's not uh, clap too much yet. No, not too much, but a little bit of hope there. 
Um, and also closer to home, we've got the biggest mayoral race ever. With, what is it? 17 candidates? 20, 20, 21? 21 candidates. Um, and this week, uh, Mendoza's uh, record was questioned on her... Uh, Signatures. Sub, no, no, the, her record on... Uh, capital punishment. Capital punishment. Oh, yes. um, she said it when was one thing. When she did and did not support it. Exactly. Um, Dorothy Brown's fraudulent petitions were shown for <laughs> all the world to see. Um, please it's interesting let the, that a... Please let that be half of her signatures. That a local TV station, in this case, I believe, ABC Channel 7 spent the time to go into the Board of Elections. I'm not sure many TV cameras have ever shown up there except on Election Day, and they dug oh, in they looking have. at records. And, boy, we're getting a civics lesson here that I think is really important. Yeah. I mean, I've been in those strange rooms for hours on end, and, yes, uh, you have. depending on what the issue is. They've, the cameras have been there. But I think this, this season they'll be there a lot. Um, okay, so... Okay. We do we have... This blue code of silence trial continuing. These three cops that covered up the Laquan. This is a breakthrough of immense dimensions to me. Tremendously. It, to have those two police officers speak the truth this week about what was false, done by their brother, brothers and sisters in uniform, it's a huge breakthrough. I Please. actually think they deserve some city they medal have, of they're, honor they're for heroes. stepping forward they're because heroes. their life has to have been hell the last Still two years. That. Yeah, absolutely, and... and Probably will continue to be. Um, Network 49 is a very big membership meeting coming up this week on Thursday, December 6th mm -hmm. at 7 p.m. at Willie White. We are having a regular membership meeting and updates and a special guest by mayoral candidate Tony Breckwinkle. Yes, we're we hosting. We are planning to ask her some tough questions. Tough hosting questions. a visit. Tony. Yeah, God. God love the 49th Ward. Let's hope she leaves in one piece. And finally, yesterday was the official retirement day for one of our real local heroes and public Ward. servants, and we hope continue neighbor and friend and colleague David Orr. Um, we are looking forward to what you might be doing next, but certainly your, uh, your work as city clerk and your one week as mayor of Chicago is something we all remember fondly. Yeah, and he's he's also going to continue to be, as you know, he can't help it. He was here on the show not that long ago talking about democracy um, with the small d and continuing to foment democracy with a small d. And he's way excited about the aldermanic races um, across, across the city and, and that no matter who winds up in the mayor's seat, if we have, if we've built a a more progressive city council, the possibilities are endless um, on what can happen. So um, I don't know, with that, uh, should we um, move to our station ID? I just want to remind people you're listening to Live <laughs> in the Heartland at WLUW 88.7 FM, and let's have a little bit of music. We may not have a cent to pay the rent. Oh, welcome back to Live from the Heartland. That was a little bit of Mavis Staples to try to get us warmed up on a gray Saturday morning. A quick plug for the best trees, if you're looking for that in this <laughs> holiday season. Stop by at uh, St. Nicholas on Ridge Avenue in Evanston, where you can get all of your Christmas needs, craft fair, greenery, and the best trees around. Thank you for letting me make, make that plug, folks. Uh, Katie was talking about the need to have pretty thorough discussion off of David's or his retirement for what happens next and how we bring new leaders in. And we have one of those new leaders with us this morning, Maria Hayden, who is H Hadden, who is automatic <laughs> candidate in We're the 49th Ward. We have four candidates who have filed, um, including incumbent Joe Moore and Bill Morton, and I forget who the fourth is, I should know. But in any event, Maria, thank you so much for joining us. And I, I always start this conversation off for people who are starting off in politics. Mm -hmm. Why is such a nice person like Maria running for politics? Because <laughs> um, we need better people in politics <clears throat> um, is, the, is the short answer. Um, so I'm not originally from Chicago, from Columbus, Ohio, but I've been here for 15 years and working uh, adjacent to politics, so working with elected officials and working with uh, community groups that are trying to affect change like in how our government works in Chicago and in about half a dozen cities around the country um, it's became clear to me over these last eight years that some of those um, 
skills, building with people, and working on the outside of politics are the same kind of behaviors and attitudes that we need in our political arena. And the only way we're going to get it is by continuing to support um, independent progressive people running for office um, and getting enough of us in there. Did you know that uh, David Orr was from Ohio, too? I did not know that David yeah, was from yeah. Ohio. I always tell uh, everybody there are great people from Ohio. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, there are great people from Ohio. Um, a whole Midwestern kind of thing going on. Yeah, you know, we so love coming to Chicago. How long have you been, uh, how long since you declared you were running? Um, it's been almost a year. Yeah, so that's what I, I launched I launched uh, January 20th of uh, 2018, so of this year, um, on my birthday. Yes. Yes. We are we are all January birthdays here or February. We're <laughs> Capricorns and Aquarians. <laughs> all right. Um, so just uh, why don't you give us your main platform issues, the things that, that you try and make sure every audience hears from you when you greet them in, in the neighborhood. The short version, of course, but, yeah. you know. No. Um, so, you know, I've lived in the 49th Ward for 11 years and uh, uh, pretty centrally in the East Rogers Park community. And in my time there, uh, before campaigning and, and since starting this campaign, talking to hundreds and hundreds of our neighbors, the issues that people in the 49th Ward want to see, we want to maintain affordable housing. Right. We want to make sure we can stay in Rogers Park and in 49th Ward, um, you know, through whatever next wave of development we're facing. We want accessible housing. We want to have good neighborhood public schools, and I plan to be a champion for that where the current alderman has not been. We want to support our small, locally owned businesses um, because it makes up a diverse part of our community um, in, in supporting a lot of our efforts. We want um, a safe and healthy community, looking at how um, we need to develop better relationships in our community with one another through block clubs and other efforts that are not just about adding more police, um, because community safety looks different for, for different people. And we also want to see good government, so just accountability and transparency. So one of the biggest challenges I see <coughs> overall in Chicago, but in the 49th Ward too, is how frequently um, community members are kind of pushed aside, told that we don't matter, and that our voices are not centered in decision making, and that's something that needs to change. So, you know, for many, many years, <clears throat> uh, Joe Moore's been in office for a long time. Mm -hmm. 28 years almost. 28 years, all right. So when he s hears you say something like you just said, and he goes, oh no, I don't push people aside. I've, I've invited them in, I've had community meetings out the yin yang for 28 years. How, how do you how do you respond to that? Sure, um, he has. There are some great things that he's done. So uh, I know you guys are all familiar with the participatory budgeting process, so PB49. Mm -hmm. So he's the first elected official in the United States, right, to bring this very transparent, community-centered decision-making process to um, our community. I was a volunteer in that first year, and mm -hmm. participating actually really put me on a trajectory to, to bring this work to more spaces. And also, just because you have one program that's engaging, there are a lot of decisions that he makes and that city councilors make around the city that have bigger impacts on the lives of Chicagoans, like around the funding for our schools, mm -hmm. what's happening with our long-term infrastructure plans, what we're doing in our finance committees to, to pay off lawsuits and, and uh, you know issues with accountability, how our large city agencies are working, um, and also who gets to build in our community, right, around development and zoning decisions. And for those major decisions, largely we're closed out of them. Um, and the people that are involved are usually a small group of people that some of whom have been with around for 28 years. We don't need to exclude those people, but I believe it's the role of an elected official to always be bringing in new people to the table and centering folks most impacted by decisions and decision making. I don't think he does a good job of that. Mm -hmm. What, uh, what do you think you could do that would change the dynamic we've been going through all this summer with an apparent upsurge in shooting? Now, I've been in the neighborhood 28 years. I mm -hmm. remember when things were worse, but I'm not sure better or worse is the right way to talk about community That's safety right. because mm -hmm. there's so many emotions and personal on-the-street experience. Well, you've been there um, as well. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with the current sense of, oh, we've got to change our 
habits because of these random shootings? Yeah. Or not so random, depending on one's point of view or the particular incident. No, that's a good question. And, and certainly... Um, I've lived in the world long enough to know, to know like on paper that, you know, our violent crimes and our shootings are down, right? right? So like factually they're lower and also you're absolutely right. Um, Every shooting matters, right? And it matters to someone and it impacts and ripples out through communities and how we feel and how our leaders and institutions support us in getting through and dealing with these tragedies is super important. One of the, the, things I've been happiest to see and am supportive of and intend to support more as in office as well is the the resurgence of people starting new block clubs. Yeah. So we, we need to know each other block by block. Um, having those close connections um, adds to senses of safety, both in how we're feeling and real results, right? So if we think about crime prevention, um, the prevention of um, um, all kinds of maybe negative behaviors, Um, us knowing each other, we can look out for one another. The other piece of it is um, it also adds to the real safety of some of the negative things we saw, right, with this kind of Rogers Park uh, shooter, the kind of unexplained, um, still at large shootings that we had. Mm -hmm. We had some really terrible instances of neighbors going into vigilanteism, right? We had a couple folks dragging people off the street to the police station um, and profiling, you know, African-American men that fit the description. And, you know, so block clubs, um, making sure that we have training focused on equity, um, focused on how we make inclusive spaces for one another are ways that we can build safety for everyone and also a tighter knit, resilient community. Um, so that when some unpreventable tragedy strike, we can bounce back and take care of one another moving forward. Yeah, I, <laughs> you know, the, the, the profiling that you just described, that, that fellow who everyone is scared of, the, the lone shooter, shooter, has not even been identified by race because his face was covered. Mm-hmm. And so they, they, I think they initially did identify him racially and then pulled back. And then they from retracted, that. yep. Um, because it really is, you cannot tell. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and the, and the difference, the different weight accorded different crimes. For example, I, you know, I heard on the news the other morning that there was a murder in Rogers Park at 11 o'clock the night before. I went to the websites, there was nothing about it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the alderman had something about his follow me on Friday. He had some other thing up that had just been put up, but nothing about this murder, which then later um, we knew the, the name of the victim and we also knew it was not it was not that guy who's just shooting people anonymously. Right. Which means it's it's a lesser importance because it's it's these quote unquote bad guys or these the the bad element in the neighborhood shooting each other. I think we should still be concerned, right? Absolutely. And it, it says something about um, us as a community. Yeah. Um, and you know, our leaders and especially our elected leaders are I think have the responsibility to set the tone. Um, and it's, it devalues um, whole areas of our ward Amen. and whole um, groups of people in our ward when, when certain crimes are, and, and victims are given like higher priority. And also, I think there's this, um, this practice of deeming them as innocent victims. You know, when you yes, see people right. talking about, well, we had these innocent victims. Right, right. The, like the others know, are no, guilty. But nobody deserves to be shot and killed. Right. Um, and we need to make sure that we're working towards a space where we um, are reducing as many of those those murders and tragedies as possible and also taking seriously the impact. So that the latest murder victim, um, he's the father of a child in one of our Rogers Park schools. Right, right. Yeah. Maria, I was going to uh, take it back to the election of, uh, of next to group of alder people in our city council. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering uh, what your thoughts are and if you have any ties with uh, progressives running in other wards. There's a lot of independent political organizations. And just share a little of that information so we get a sense of the kind of swell, the ground swell that's coming. Uh, and then uh, once elected and... One question at a time, Michael. Come on, give her a chance. Okay, I'll let her do that. Then I'll all ask right. her another one. All right, all right. Um, so this has been... So this is my first time running for office. You guys you guys know that. And... Um, 
it's been one of the most positive, um, challenging, but positive experiences that I've ever had. And it is because we've got um, a lot of like-minded younger folks around the city that are kind of taking up this challenge. Um, we see a Chicago and people in leadership elected positions that are not solving our problems. They're not taking them seriously. And especially being a part of a lot of youth-led movements over the last four or five years, there's a sentiment that a lot of folks in these in city council are not taking seriously the voices of young people in Chicago. And so now a lot of them are running for office. Um, so you may see a little hashtag and some branding around for a brand new council. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen this, but it's, um, you know, several folks and it's not just one candidate in each ward, but several, sometimes multiple candidates in different wards um, where we've been trying to support one another, knowing that we're going through kind of shared experiences. And I think largely have a lot of shared visions of getting in and being a more accountable group of people that's more representative and more inclusive um, in changing the style of how city council works. Um, not just changing the people, but changing the culture. I was going to uh, bring up, uh, I was talking to one of Joe Moore's uh, favorite people, and uh, their account of your race is basically that you're going to get the millennials. And I would imagine, and what I said, I said, I think she has a, a, a larger base than that. I think there are people of all ages, uh, all races, et cetera, who are... Uh, disenchanted with the current situation or looking for a change. What are your thoughts on that? Um, yes. So, I mean, I see it in, you know, races around the country, but also in, you know, every, every conversation that I have at the doors with residents in our community. Um, I've been pretty involved for a while, so I didn't start from scratch, right? Like, I know a lot of people. And also, I'm meeting so many more folks um, who had no idea who I was. And uh, just like folks in my parents' generation, right? Like my parents are, you know, mid 60s, early 70s. Um, they are looking to younger leaders to take up this space and to take on these challenges. So I don't think it's just a millennial vote, though I will note that the largest uh, age group in the 49th ward is my age group. Which is? Um, so I'm, I'm like, so folks that are somewhere between like 25 and like 40. Yeah, I'm 38. Getting up there. I want to return to uh, participatory budgeting as a template or a starting point. Um, uh, Joe Moore rightfully gets credit for starting this particular approach, but uh, some, uh, what, 15 years later that Ten. it's been going? 10 years later. Um, we're still talking about a big process to look at a million dollars being split up. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering why there's not more money in that pot and to what extent that template to do murals and, and, and fix sidewalks and whatnot, money that I think should come out of the capital budget of the city, not out of the Alderman's discretionary fund, mm -hmm. um, how we could expand that kind of approach to community decision-making over resources to not only murals, but schools, uh, escalators at the Morris L, uh, improvements in the lakefront, our great country club, how do we actually bring what participatory budgeting has been teaching us over 10 years mm -hmm. into the rest of city government? Or, or to put it another way, do we continue to have to do hunger games in order to get uh, to things get the that, basics? To things that should be a part of the budget anyway? Yeah, no, no these are great questions. So from the, the first experience in the 49th Ward, right, so that's 2009 to 2010, um, I actually, the, the, the two folks that helped Joe design our process and this community-based design process, um, Jean Paulo Baoki and Josh Lerner, um, I called them up after our first year and um, I decided this was what I wanted to do. And if they were doing this and helping other folks get PB started around the country, I wanted to be a part of it. Um, so uh, I was one of the founding board members of the Participatory Budgeting Project. So around the world, uh, PB um, is hitting 30 years and we're hitting 10 years in the United States. Most places, most PB processes, they're citywide, they're larger budgets, and they're also not just restricted to bond money, right? So there are less restrictive funds. Um, and, uh, to give you a, an interesting visual of what we could be doing in Chicago with PB versus what we're currently doing. Um, so Chicago started in 2009 with our 49th Ward process. Based on the 49th Ward demonstration as a pilot, um, we were able to get four council members in New York City uh, working with an organization called Community Voices Heard to, to get them started. 
So they started a year, year later, 2010, 2011. There are 51 council districts in New York City, and now roughly 35 of them do participatory budgeting with anywhere from a million to two million, and there's a, it's a, a more lenient budget, not as restrictive, and there are some more interesting projects, higher levels of engagement that we're seeing there, and we've been able to move it to where it was institutionalized within the city, right? City put real resources behind it. Here in Chicago, um, call it our culture, um, a lot of it really has stopped, um, been a stop at the mayor's office um, of plenty, I think we've had upwards of a dozen aldermen that have done it in total. We currently have eight um, out of 50. So compared to New York, we haven't seen the same political leadership stepping up to move it beyond the ward system. And I think that that's indicative of the same things we see with how Chicago aldermen work. If things are working in their ward and they're turning out fine for them, they're content to just sit back right. um, and not progress. And so PB, people do um, PB processes around citywide issues, focusing on youth engagement. Um, in the longest running North American experiment is with com uh, public housing, Toronto community housing, where public housing residents get to decide how to spend upwards of $9 million for making real improvements. So there's so many ways we could use this mm -hmm. um, to engage young people, to fix real issues with our schools, to make larger decisions about infrastructure. Um, it's a great civic education tool and something I plan to continue, but really think in the city, we need to move beyond just the menu money and see where we can use this tool to really activate more people to be more active in government. So it's May or June of 2019, and okay. you've just taken your oh, first seat in the city council okay. as the new alderman of the 49th Ward. Mm -hmm. What's the first thing you tackle? Um, Is it a roof at Kilmer? <laughs> Is it a restored, uh, accessible boardwalk at Loyola Beach? Is there like, something else like, on your I like, dream I like, list? I like that. I like that. What's your first there? thing? What's the first Loyola thing that you're getting out? <laughs> um, so definitely at the citywide level, um, you mentioned kind of the new roof at Kilmer. Um, I am very motivated to, to figure out how we're going to push CPS to have a fair and equitable funding formula for our schools. Um, I think that's a, like a top priority. I'm also, um, also another priority, um, you guys know I talk about development without displacement for our ward and looking at aldermanic uh, decision making around zoning. At the citywide level, I think we need to push more of what we're seeing, um, some more policies and practices that we see and what actually the mayor is promoting in this little village in Pilsen um, kind of restoration development plan where we're increasing the levels, like the percentage requirements of affordable housing and developments, putting a floor where developers can't buy out, um, implementing some funding, some grant or low income uh, or low per, like kind of low interest loan programs for small owners, like those one to four unit owners, um, to get money for capital improvements for their building. And so looking at what we can provide in city programs to make sure that in the 49th ward, we can manage development without displacing a bunch of our residents and working to see that CPS is moving forward to make sure that every child in Chicago is getting the, the resources that they need would be two of my top priorities. Okay. So, um, I, you know, God, there's so much to do in this city. Yeah. There's so much in need of help. <laughs> um, and, you know, a lot of us, uh, those of us who were alive when Harold Washington was mayor, we, we have a picture of what a, a city working together <laughs> can actually accomplish um, with good leadership at the at the center of it. Um, I mean, when Harold Washington was elected, a sud suddenly half of the aldermen became progressive mm -hmm. because they had to. Because if their voters saw them vote or be against Harold Washington, they would be out in a moment. So we probably don't have that this year. Um, we have a lot of good candidates for mayor. I mean, we have a lot of, I feel interested in the mayor's race because I see the top three or four people right now as all women of color mm -hmm. um, running. As a woman of color yourself and a lesbian, what kind of pushback have you gotten on that basis alone um, in, your, mm -hmm. in the race this far? Um, you know, I think it speaks to our ward and our community that not much yeah. Um, I, I would, Advantages in some ways. Yeah, right. So not much. Um, mm -hmm. I will say, though, that 
Um, though I've spent my life working in like nonprofits and public service and volunteering, I both my um, you know university degrees are focused on public service. Um, some of those barriers of being a woman of color, yeah. um, specifically, right. were kind of built into me even thinking I'd run for office. Yeah, I sure. never thought I'd run for office. Sure. So while once making the decision yeah. um, and, and talking to folks, I found nothing but a supportive environment. Um, I think that, you know, women, women of color and other marginalized like folks still have these built in socialized barriers. Um, that turns out to be a great year to run as as a woman yeah, of color, yeah. <laughs> as it turns no. out. And and oh, this other question that I know that people will raise um, after a guy being in office for 28 years, people like stability mm-hmm. or what they perceive as stability. And he came into office following David Orr, who had one of the best service offices in the city. Mm-hmm. Um, and he continued to have a great service office. Well, so, he got it better after he almost lost an election. Then he upped the ante. He did, he did. But um, I guess what we're asking is how, why should 49th Ward voters replace someone with such a great staff who is so responsive compared to others? Which I've always said about people who live in the 49th Ward have no idea what th- what hell it is to be in a, an award that's represented by somebody who, who really never looks at, mm-hmm. at uh, their own backyard. What do you say to folks who say, yeah, I'm kind of comfortable. I, I don't see anything wrong, really. Uh, what? Well, I mean, it's always, <laughs> it's always folks who aren't feeling the pain, who don't understand the need for change, one. Bingo. Um, but two, I, I understand and, and firmly believe that the ward service office um, needs to be a core kind of touchstone for the community. So beyond having you know, fantastic staff that I think are going to be very important. Like I, I know, I believe it's a high priority to have good customer service, um, knowledgeable people who actually like people, um, and who treat people with respect in an office, but also the office needs to be a hub for other information. So a lot of our ward services, um, a lot of the things people traditionally think about, they're, they're centralized and we need to manage them and connect people to the right place. But we also, um, shouldn't be paying people $116,000 a year just to manage 311 requests. We've got a whole city to run, and we need aldermen that are going to step up to those challenges because we need a Chicago that's going to be here for the next 100 years, and the way city council's running it now, um, it won't be. Maria Hayden, candidate for 49th Ward Alderman. Uh, we wish you best in the coming campaign, and thank you for joining us on Life in the Heart. Oh, thanks morning. for having me. Any any last thing, Maria Hayden, for uh, for the listeners out there? Um, you know, I'd just say uh, pay attention to your aldermanic races. So there's going to be a lot of coverage on the mayoral stuff, um, and you'll you'll have your time to consider. But if you uh, if you live in the 49th Ward, check out my website. It's Maria for 49. Has anybody given you twenty thousand dollars? Uh, no one has given me twenty thousand dollars, but if anyone wants to give me five thousand six hundred dollars, that's the limit I can uh, I can accept. Um, from, okay, uh, from individuals. You've, so you've heard it there. Definitely first. taking donations. Step up, you um, individuals. But if you don't live in the 49th ward, check out your aldermanic races because I yeah. I definitely agree with you guys. Like our city council um, is going to be an important piece of of what's happening over the next four years. Bless your heart, and good luck, Maria Haddon. Thank you. Going forward. You're listening to Live from the Heartland on WLUW 88.7 FM. All right, that was Link Ray playing Ramble. What is that familiar from? Oh, Michael was tooling around yesterday and told me to listen to this, and I listened to it. It's about a 50-year-old piece right. that led to all sorts of other stuff. But it okay. was classic at the time, and yes. I just thought it was a nice kind of interlude it music. It did feel 50 years old. I actually uh, was driving back across country with uh, my son and my wife, and uh, it was Katie and Lake James from Twin Peaks who turned me on to Link Race after his earlier surfer music. There's some really socially conscious music, which is this is not one of them, but... He's quite a guy, and he uh, went back in the woods and uh, hung out and recorded some great music. Okay. We are now happy and uh, grateful to have uh, Glenn Silber, the director of War at Home, a documentary that is 39, almost 40 years old, and is being shown right now at the uh, Siskel Center last night and tonight. 
And welcome, Glenn. Thanks so much for having me. It's actually being shown for the whole week, except whole for week. Sunday, yeah. And we I want to thank uh, Heather Booth, too, for telling her, you that you should get a hold of me. Well, Heather's going to be with me tonight at the screening at the Film Center, which is about 5.15 p.m., and Heather, of course, is a legendary activist, and I have nothing but admiration for her, and I'm thrilled that she's going to be with us tonight to talk about the connections between that period in the 60s and what we're going through today. What do you think the connections are between, uh, yeah. give us a little hint about what your movie's about and where it leads us to at the present moment. All right, The War at Home is an Oscar-nominated uh, feature documentary about the impact of the war in Vietnam on one American town, Madison, Wisconsin. And it looks at the political resistance movement against that war as it started really small and then grew over seven, eight years into being a, like a mass movement as it was everywhere in the country. But we took an approach of the microcosm. Let's look at what happened in one town so we can really dig deep into what happened and see every step of the way. Now, how does that connect to the present mess we're in? Well, it's 50 years ago, right? It was 50 years ago today, Sgt. Peppers taught the band to play. <laughs> <laughs> and we learned how to play, and it was uh, quite an experience. I came to Madison as a freshman in 1968, 18 years old, didn't know anything about anything, really. Came from a sheltered little bubble community in suburban New Jersey. And the day after I got there, someone slipped a leaflet under my door saying, come to a meeting about the, from the Wisconsin Draft Resistance Union. Yeah. I was being organized from day one to learn yeah. about the war. Well, I was also 18 in 1968, uh -huh, as was he. And uh, it was a great year to be 18. It sure was. Uh, and, and when you, we were talking before the show, uh, we were basically, you were giving the anti-war movement an eight-year life. Well, in Madison, at least, we mm -hmm. see it, the first anti-war demonstration. We got hold of all the footage that was ever shot in Madison, Wisconsin, from all three local stations throughout the 60s. And kept yourself busy for about a year and a half. Yeah, like four and a half years, actually. Jeez. And did you have to pay for that footage the way a lot of people pay for documentary footage? Oh, no, we could never have made the yeah. film if we did. We, we had, got really lucky. I'll get back to your question in a second about the connections. But what happened to us that was the luckiest break of my career, and it's been a pretty long career, was... I was trying to make this film. I had this great idea. I was almost obsessed with making the story about w what we'd gone through to mm -hmm. preserve it. So that's yep. for art for then and for my kids and gen. Sure. And, you know, I thought there'd be all this footage easy to find, but there wasn't. And I was going to the Wisconsin Historical Society and not doing very well. And then one day the head man there said, hey, Silver, get over here. This might be your lucky day. We just got a donation from WKOW, the ABC affiliate, of every frame they shot from 1959 to 1972, but it's a mess. We don't know what's in it, and we don't have the money to get into it, so wow. you've been bugging me for a few weeks already, maybe months. If you want to be the one to go through it or get a researcher to help you, we'll make a little sweat equity deal. You go through it, you clean it up, you replace the splices, you tell us what's in it, and we'll give you that footage for free. Wow. It's some beautiful footage. I mean, there's, uh, you've got it all. You've got from the early on a number mm -hmm. of people uh, dressed up in suit and ties doing demonstrations to the to wonderful Mifflin Street where there was all these, you know, the Mifflin Street co-op and uh, a lot of uh, kind of a, a street party, a block party that the police turn into a, police a massacre. Ma yeah. Um, take what, us through. What year was that? 69. <laughs> because that, that was the year that um, we were sending people up you know, literally ambulances, people's ambulances we yep. were sending yeah. up to Madison oh, yeah. during, during some well, of that some, active... Some activity. of the highlights in the film, if you just want to go with the overview, yeah, is you start in this really amazing... It was amazing to see that footage, like you say, people, 150 people protesting the war in October of, 80, of uh, 1963. I think that's the first demonstration in the country of more than two people. I think that's right. There was one, two, there's, everyone refers to a, two people stood outside the White House with a sign. That's like, that's the first demonstration. That's not a demonstration. I think that is a demonstration. <laughs> that's right. good enough, I but mean, yours was a bigger demonstration. Okay. The well, first big demonstration. All right, so then you have to track, people were reacting to what happened in the war. Let's say February 65, they start bombing Vietnam, so-called Operation Rolling Thunder. Right. And you see 60, 70 people carrying signs. They were already, they knew what they were doing. Right. They had already studied this. Then you move ahead, of course, we had the students sit and took over the administration building because they were cooperating with the draft. Right. That's 66. 
67, of course, we have a two-year campaign against the Dow Chemical Company that was making napalm, which is really like a war crime, this explosive jelly that yeah. burns people to death. Oh, God, and remember. so they, after two years, they got more militant, and there's a turning point in October of 67 when we, they sat in against Dow and they weren't to, to, to uh, block the recruiters mm -hmm. from recruiting more napalm makers on our campus. Right. Why couldn't they just go to the Hilton Hotel somewhere and do it? Who knows? That was a mistake by the university, and it blew up, and you see the dramatic action. It's, where it seems like the university made mistake after mistake. I mean, they, they reacted with uh, military force. Uh, well, the governor. Did, the, they didn't the, have any experience with this. Yeah. You know, we were all making it up in a way. Yep. We were responding to the war, and we were learning how to protest. That's right. And this gets back to your question, Mike. What's the connection between what we went through? Let's say in 1968, pick out that year, 50 years ago. 585,000 U.S. troops in Vietnam, and they're still not winning. We learned recently that, Mac that uh, Westmoreland, General Westmoreland, wanted to move atomic weapons. Right. And even Johnson, who couldn't take the political heat anymore, wouldn't let him do it. That shows how much power we had, even by 68. Yeah, to constrain how much them. hubris we had. Well, and, and narrow minded silo living. Okay. No, no, he's through. talking about power that the movement had. The, mo the movement to stop them from, to constrain them, to restrain yeah. them. As early as that. Yeah, that's yeah. true, because we didn't know that. We didn't know right. how much power we had. And then, right. of course, it blew up in Chicago here, right. and everyone watched it on TV. But the connect between 68 and the times earlier and what's going on now is that we had to build a political culture off the seat of our pants. We had leaders. And they taught us what to do. They had strategies, and most of us were young, mm -hmm. and we got into it, and we mm -hmm. learned by experience. So if you go back 50 years and you look at that political culture that was built, I don't think you could have had the women's marches all over the country or the kids marching against gun violence in that fashion if we hadn't had the moratorium in 1969. I, I think that's a really um, a valid point. I, I think that getting the country, getting the ground used to people's feet marching, and used to people gathering in the Civic Center. I know my first anti-war march was in high school uh, in 67 at uh, the Civic Center. And I was kind of scared, quite frankly. Well, uh, we have people who, when they talk about going to their first demonstration, if you've seen the film, the guy who became the head of SDS in Madison in 65, he wasn't fixated on the war per se, but he wanted to go to a meeting to find out about it. And he said, well, I was kind of scared. You yeah. know, kind of a hangover from the 50s. Exactly. And even Carl Armstrong in the movie, who's a big character in the film, he talks about how his father warned him, never go to demonstration because the government will get your name and they'll put it in a file and they'll hold it against you for the rest of your life. This, this Coming a, off of the McCarthy era. Yeah. Coming off the McCarthy era, but if you're a brown person trying to come over a border today, you've been labeled the same way. Well, that's, that's uh, it's not, a little bit of apples and oranges, but it's yeah. to me the parallels that, were, that came out of this book uh, out of this movie, uh, reminding me this could be a very important thing to include in civics lessons. From well, this point every kid in the country growing up should see this movie. Absolutely. They don't even know this is part of their history, and they need to know about it. And you know what? It's not their fault, really, for two reasons. Number one, think about this. Of course this. not. We're as far away today as from 1968 as we were in 1968 from World War One. That's right. And World War One had zero impact on and my we, life. We knew nothing about World War One. We did not know that Europe had lost their, an entire generation of young men. So how do we reach out to the young people? Because going through school, when you hit that point in history lesson, it was May at the end of the school year, and you kind of, the you know, the, the Second World War, the First World War got a little bit of treatment, but by the Second World War in Korea, we weren't, it wasn't being covered at all. Well, so here is the question. What's the connection between that period of political culture where we learned how to do it, okay, at every level? And we responded largely to the war, you know, and, and to the war and the war makers like Dow Chemical, which was really, the Dow Chemical protest in Madison, I think, is really, it's not only the turning point in Madison, it's one of the most important demonstrations ever because people had learned for two years been protesting against napalm. It was mm -hmm. a moral outrage to right. us. They would do that. We had these pictures of poor Vietnamese kids burned almost to death. Right. And so the government sent out these truth teams to try to explain it to us. And we see that in the film when they come out and we've got 500 people confronting them. And then later on, about a year later, they have another demonstration where they try to block the, the uh, recruiters and they kind of get, you know, they get arrested. Well, this time that... It was a rough arrest. It was a rough arrest, yeah. Well, in 67, another six months later, 
we had a, a much stronger protest. And that's when the moment when the movement turned from protest to resistance. And that's where we're going to have Important. to get back to now. When you see the film and you see this seven, eight-year history, one of the takeaways that people need to appreciate, especially younger people, is one demonstration is not going to do it. Mm -hmm. You need to have a focus, you need to have a strategy, and need you need to, to be committed agenda. for the long haul. Yeah. And we're in a boatload of trouble, people, so we better get back to that. Mm. Yeah, one of the things in the movie that uh, it showed a turning point where there was uh, you know, growing resistance to the the war, but then they, you had to block any people from Washington coming to speak policy, and you brought Kennedy in, Teddy Kennedy. Oh. And he kind of won the crowd back, but it was an interesting thing. Tell well, us about Well, what that. happened was, in, I think it was October 66, one of uh, the leaders in Madison says, uh, setting up the Kennedy administration, that the students had announced they were not going to let any speakers from the federal government come to, to tell them about the war, or use that for a platform in Madison. So. Teddy Kennedy was friends with uh, Pat Lucy, who was running for governor. Yeah. They were old family friends somehow. And so he comes in, young guy, and he goes out to the stock pavilion, 2,000 people packing it. And this leader, Evan Stark, who's like amazing, he says, he describes the strategy. And you really see an organizer at work. You see how they did it. He says, we decided we we're going to put 30 members of our committee to end the war in Vietnam behind the podium with signs so that when we, when we interrupted the speech, the, it, the voices would carry out into the larger room. Then you had another 50 or so people in the, facing the stage. And Kenny Kennedy is so shocked by this. He's like a deer caught in the headlights. And then he invites one of the protesters up on stage with him as if they're <laughs> going to have a little discussion. He's a little rude to the guy. And, he, and then he shuts him down. <laughs> but at that moment, Marjorie Tabankin is a very important organizer in the anti-war movement, and she was in Madison and later on became a national figure. She talked about how even though she was on the side of the protesters, she wasn't ready, she was embarrassed by it. And there was a, a petition came out the next day to apologize to Kennedy, and she wasn't ready for the confrontation. But it's an amazing scene. It really is one that a lot of people cite as being something they never even knew about. No, there's a lot in the movie we didn't know about. Now, this movie goes along, looking again at Madison and, and the anti-war movement over an eight- or ten-year period, but you, you end up with the bombing of the math building on the campus, and, and I want to address this point a bit, because the war at home, or as SDS said at the time, or the weather underground, bringing the war home so that people will stop it, was something that I personally got very caught up in, because I saw many of the weather underground activities, along with the bombing, is terrorizing people at home, not really bringing the home and increasing resistance, but pissing a lot more people off. And um, that's when I got involved with more direct nonviolent action, which is part of the value, I think, of this film, is showing a variety of different kinds of organizing tactics. But if you move that into today, it was easy for a group of people, uh, religious-oriented, to go into Dow Chemical in Midland, Michigan, and erase computer records with a magnet can't do that as easily today. You can't burn uh, burn draft file records or pour blood on records like I did back in 71. Or to try to bomb the Badger Munition plant. You need, you need to be a hacker like uh, well, WikiLeaks as to, far to as operate violence, today. And as far as that kind of violence goes, I think you got to be careful because we're living in a post-9-11 world, and that kind of tactics would not go well at all. It didn't go well then because, of course, the tragedy in Madison was that I mean, look, this bombing didn't play, take place in a vacuum. This was the end of a multi-year campaign against having the Army Mathematics Research Center on our campus, having right. the Army contributing to the war on our campus. Mm -hmm. Again, why they couldn't have moved that someplace else, I don't know. But, you know, and in the movie, one of the leaders of that action, Carl Armstrong, who was caught and spent eight years in jail, he apologizes and said it wasn't justified. He felt a sense of shame. And I think that that's one of the lessons of the film. Hmm. We have to stay nonviolent because mm -hmm. in this atmosphere we're in now, it just unleashed a wave Good of point. repression. Yeah. We can't have that. I mean, again, we were making it up at that time. Except that, except that we did follow the civil rights movement, where we had seen nonviolence in action. Absolutely. And, and I think that 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 formed a lot of us. Or Gandhi going up with the British Empire. Uh, I mean, absolutely. That was very powerful for me. We, we start that. out with a montage that deals with the civil rights movement because there's no question yep. that the civil rights movement and their tactics guided Informed the path us. of the movement. That's right. But what happened was, as the war went on, as the death toll raised from right. 10,000 to 20,000, 30,000, people got desperate. People felt like one woman in the film says, she goes, I was so desperate, I felt this war was never going to end and they might destroy it. 
before the Vietnamese could determine their own outcome. Mm. And don't forget, we mentioned this a little earlier, Westmoreland, we were talking earlier, he, we now know as of about four weeks ago from the historian Michael Beschloss, he was pushing President Johnson to move nuclear weapons into South Vietnam. We didn't know this until a month ago. And the fact that Johnson, of course, who declined to run again, he virtually resigned from office because of the anti-war movement, and the fact that he wouldn't let Westmoreland have those atomic weapons in South Vietnam. Can you just imagine, remember Hir Hiroshima, you know, that was going to help shorten the war, which we know was really kind of a lie to begin with, because they could have ended the war at that point a lot easier than killing 100,000, 180,000 people. So I just think Westmoreland was losing the war, couldn't take it, and he wanted to bring nuclear weapons in. So it's kind of a false equivalency to say, like, this violence was something even remotely compared to what was happening, killing ultimately three million Vietnamese. Yeah. No, I, but it's a lesson we have to learn. We cannot resort to violence because it's going to backfire and it's going to lead to a They're the a ones fascist. with the guns, you know. Come yeah, on. and, 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 and they I got thought, all the equipment. <laughs> you know, the weather on the ground, tactics, you know, they, I, di I didn't really go for that because for the same reasons we're talking now. Yeah. And, I re you know. Go. Uh, Glenn Silbert, uh, the movie The War at Home got a wonderful review yesterday in the Tribune. And... Uh, we don't usually like the Tribune that much, but we'd <laughs> like you to tell us about that. And then I would like you to follow that with a, a little bit about how is it going getting this film around. I know you're showing it in theaters, but also you and I were talking about how we just get it out to the masses. Yeah. Well, we were very honored that Michael Phillips wrote an A-plus review for us, a real rave review. And he starts out the review, he's saying, like, it's a, it's a legitimate question to ask yourself, what can a 39-year-old documentary about the 60s anti-war movement teach us about the mess we're in today. And his next two words are, Everything. a lot, <laughs> a lot. And Is a lot one or two words? Two okay, words, thank you. And so he goes on to describe how much, he says it's um, unbelievable how much Silver and my co-director Barry Alexander Brown pack into this movie. And you know, one thing we didn't mention is we tell the story chronologically. Mm -hmm. yeah. We had to, because mm -hmm. there's so much going on that if we were to jump around, I think it would have been confusing. And our main goal, was to try to be able to have this record. You know, people said when we started it, it's too soon to tell this history. And I'm like a 25-year-old guy who wants to make a great film going, why? <laughs> right. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna wait for, it's our story. <laughs> right. I'm not gonna wait for someone else to tell it. So we were really concerned about preserving the history, telling the story in a way that it was easily understandable to the next generation and the generation after that. And you know what, this is really the only film on the anti-war movement. Glenn, get, can, I was just going to say, did you see the Vietnam uh, series? Yeah, I sure did. Don't you feel like your film is the thing that was left out of it? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Ken Burns had 18 hours of real estate I know. to tell that story. And the only person in the whole film that talks about it is Bill Zimmerman, who right. came from the University of Chicago. Right, right. And he's a friend of mine, too. And I talked to Bill afterwards, and he says, you know, I had no idea that the whole thing was going to be what I had to say. And I think it's something under seven or eight minutes for the entire series right. by my clock. It's and then and then they cut to people getting high at Woodstock. Yeah. As if, you know, the two were yeah. uh, equivalent anti war well, and, and the Here's the deal, guys. We won the culture incredible. we won the culture war. Okay? We won the culture war because what's the major takeaway from the Because we're all 60s? sitting here wearing jeans. Yeah, well also <laughs> because the women's movement is the is the real legacy of the sixties, yeah. I think. Feminism. Sure. We had certainly civil rights throughout that time, fighting for that. And of course, everything from now legalizing marijuana to gay rights to you name it, we right. won it. But you know what? There is a war at home, and we're losing it. That's right. Badly. And yeah. that's what this film, I think, hopefully will not only inspire people, but empower people to realize we have to fight back and we can win if we stay focused and we stay organized. So to answer Mike's question here about what do we do next with the film, we're taking it around the goal is to try to break even for what it's costing us to do this. But it's a way to announce that the war at home is back. Yeah. Literally and figuratively. And I felt like after the women's marches, because I was kind of depressed, like a lot of us were stunned and depressed by the results of the presidential election. My question is, the resistance started percolating up, and what can I do to contribute to it? And the answer was to make this film. And so if you go to Beat the Rain tonight, guys, forget the rain, Heather Booth is going to be with me, this legendary activist who's so important to this town and to the whole movement. We're going to be talking with the about the film afterwards, and it's playing at 5.15 p.m. at the Gene Siskel Film Center. 
and it's in a new 4K version. We restored it from its old 16 millimeter ancient 20th century format to this new G Wiz Bang 4K beautiful format. It's not just a picture. The sound is amazing. I'm so glad you mentioned the time. Yeah, 5.15. 5.15 is the time that this yeah. film is being shown and tonight. It, and afterwards and it's, is... It's playing Monday and Tuesday and Thursday afterwards. And you can go on their website. I think it's 8 o'clock on two of those days and uh -huh. 6.30 on one. Just okay. go on their website. Uh, but I'm so grateful that they brought us here because we played the film in New York, in San Francisco, Berkeley, Los Angeles, Portland, and Detroit. And the film plays great. And everyone who's in the theater loves it. We just got to get a few more people into the theater. Right. right Glenn on. Silver, thank you so much. The film is The War at Home, and we appreciate your talking about it. I certainly learned a lot from it. I wanted to ask you if you had made any other films. Since oh, yeah. Then. My biggest film, most important film, was called El Salvador and Other Vietnam, oh. which was where we were ahead of the curve. And we really. Katie, Mike, Tom, thanks for having me, guys. Oh. I think it was a joy to be here. And thank right you. on, comrade brother. Thank you, Glenn Silver. Join us next week when we have Lori Lightfoot, David Greising, and ourselves again, and music. Hallelujah. And hopefully a lighter sky and less rain. Um, we want to thank everybody who brought this show to you, Lynn Orman, Jake Levy, um, Tom, Michael, myself, and our guests, Maria Haddon and Glenn Silver. Do good in the world. The world needs all the good that you do. All power to the people. Right on. <laughs>